Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for the amazing worship band that was just leading us this morning and just, ah, man, just, just leading us into your presence, God. It, it was just, it's just been such an amazing morning already, God. God, I pray that you would continue to move as you've already been moving, Father. I pray, Lord, that you would be the one that's penetrating our hearts and convicting us and leading us to do what only you want us to do, Father. May our plans align with your plans. May our will align with your will, Father God. It's in your name we pray and everybody says, amen. amen. So today we're in the fourth week of side effects. We've been going through this series discussing the side effects of becoming or being a Christian. And as you know, becoming a Christian, following a life with Christ is not as simple as it sounds. It's not as simple as coming into a place and lifting up your hands or worshiping or dressing the right way or talking the right way, but rather I would propose to you that it is an altar of your life. It is changing your life completely. And when we look at Scripture and we've been walking through this series, we've been looking at the many, many side effects that it is actually coming into a life with Christ. And today, if you're taking notes or you're just listening, uh, we're going to be talking about this. Live uncomfortably. How many of you like living comfortably? I know I do. I love the fact that in America you can live mostly comfortably. You know, you can at least have a home and have shelter and have food and stuff like that. But that's not the type of comfort I really want to be talking about today. I want to talk about a life of comfort. And I know you guys, as well as me, have had some uncomfortable situations in your life. Correct? Show of hands. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you've been a little bit uncomfortable? Yes, a lot, a lot of nods, a lot of hands. Well, listen, uh, for me, one of the most uncomfortable, I would even go as far as to say it was the most uncomfortable position in my life that I've ever felt was asking my beautiful wife to actually be my girlfriend at the time. And some of you have heard the story, but it goes a little bit like this. It was the most uncomfortable position in the world. I've chatted with her. I prayed to God. God gave me the green light, and I was ready to go, right? I was ready to pursue her. And so sure enough, what I did uh, was I prayed and I prepared a speech, you know, like many men do. And I prepared this amazing date day. Now, you guys want to hear my date day? It, it was good. It was good. Listen, I have a 1995 orange Jeep Wrangler. I took the top off, right? And so I said, hey, Lindsay, uh, let's go watch a movie. Now, we're both Christians, right? Let's go watch a movie outdoors, right? Like uh, one of those drive-in movies. And so sure enough, we pull up orange jeep i had bought all these snacks and all these blankets and like i was like this is going to be the best date ever and i'm going to ask her to be my girlfriend and we're going to live happily ever after right like this was my plan uh and god had different plans so sure enough uh we were in the jeep i told her hey let's go watch a movie by the way this movie was like the longest movie in the world it was like two and a half hours and I was just like, I wish I would have chosen like a 30-minute movie, you know, or like a sitcom or something to watch. Because honestly, it was ridiculously long. And so sure enough, I took her there and I basically, we sat in the car. Uh, literally, the Jeep is kind of small, but she was over here. And I was on the right-hand side and there was plenty of room for Jesus in the middle, right? Like we left a ton of room. And so sure enough, like we weren't even like... Like, I was like, hey, how are you liking the movie, right? Like, she was way far, super uncomfortable. I mean, all the butterflies in my stomach. Movie is over, and I say, why don't we just sit here for a little bit? 30 minutes past, every car in the place is gone, and I couldn't muster up the courage to tell her, right? So sure enough, it's cold, right? It's freezing. It's December time, um, and so sure enough, uh, or it's January or whatever it was, and so sure enough, uh, we go back to her kind of dorm room, and she said, she kind of leaves she's leaving she's like okay 
well, goodbye. You know, this is like our first real date, you know. So she's like, okay, well, I'm leaving. You know, I think she was expecting something. And so back backtrack about a week earlier, a week earlier, her friend had called me and she told me, and I quote, when are you going to grow a pair, pardon my language, and, and ask her out? To which I responded, I don't know, right? <laughs> Not sure, you know. And so sure enough, uh, as she was leaving, I see her walking away. I give her, uh, you know, a good high five, whatever, whatever we did. And sure enough, she's walking away. And I say, Lindsay, wait. And she's like, yeah. And I muster up the courage to say, I think you're the most beautiful woman in the world. And I think, I think, I think that I would be stupid to let go of such a wonderful woman from my life, would you bestow the honor of being my girlfriend? Now, that's what I thought I was going to say. Uh, that's what I wish I would have said. But instead, the words that came out of my, in my mouth were uh, Alex, her friend. Alex told me uh, when I was going to grow a pair and ask you out. To which she responded with silence. To which I responded with, so what do you think? Dead serious. You want to talk about uncomfortable? After that, she answered with, sure, in the least convincing way possible, right? You want to talk about uncomfortable? That was one of the most uncomfortable things in my entire life. You see, because I think in life, we need to become comfortable with uncomfortable moments. Not only in our walk with relationships, not only in our walk with bosses and work in general or anything in life, but I think spiritually, we need to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. And so the first thing I want to chat with you guys today is, are you ready to die? Woo! Right? Nobody, right? Right? However, when we read in Scripture and we read the Bible, a lot of the times we see Jesus essentially saying, are you ready to die for my sake? Are you ready to take up your cross? Are you ready to be in a position where you are going to let go of everything in your life for the sake of the gospel? And so we read in Matthew 6, 24, this is where we're going to be kind of uh, in, in, in the Bible for today. And 24 starts by saying, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Must deny themselves and take up your cross. You see, I believe that we've desensitized the cross well, we'll get into that a little bit later. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? When we read a passage like this one, we read it. And it somewhat enters into our brain that living a life with Christ, there's almost a prerequisite of suffering. It's almost a prerequisite. Like, you want to live for me? You have to deny yourself. You have to let go of the things that are not pleasing to me. Is it easy? No. Is it comfortable? No. Nobody ever claimed that following Christ was going to be comfortable. In fact, there's many things that I've needed to do in my life, that my family have needed to do in our life, taking a step of faith almost blindly, believing in God's word, trusting in his plan, trusting in his promise, trusting in the purpose and the plan that he had for our life. But was it comfortable? No. In fact, many times God called us out of our comfort zone to fulfill his plan. And so we then read in Matthew 16 something that's kind of interesting. The verses before 21 through 23 is basically talking about almost the dismay of Peter, right? 
And this, this is what it says. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. He's now telling the disciples, hey, you just need to understand that I'm going to leave, I'm going to die, and then be raised to life. And the disciples are mind-boggled, but especially Peter. Peter kind of lashes out almost. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. And listen to this part right here. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Have you ever asked yourself this? Have you ever reflected on the questions if your concerns are heavenly or if your concerns are earthly? Have you asked yourself, am I only doing this thing called life for me or for God? Because it's so easy to get into a mindset of, well, this life is mine and I'm going to do it the way that I want. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to say what I want. I'm going to drink what I want, watch what I want. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do whatever I want because this life is mine. And I believe that when we see this piece of scripture right here, we see Jesus saying, no, 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 you're wrong. Your concern should not be about you. It should be about God. It should be about what he wants to do in you, what he wants to do through you, what he wants to do to accomplish something that's greater than you. Jesus turns to his disciples and he's letting them know this very difficult message. I'm going to die. I'm going to suffer. Can you imagine someone that you love? Someone that you follow? Someone that you have lived life and have done life with for so long tell you, hey, I'm going to leave. I'm going to die and I'm going to suffer. You see, Christians use this language of self-denial, and we read this cross-bearing or, or cross bearing verse, and a lot of the times in this Western culture and, and in this American gospel, we take it more metaphorically than literally. We take it to be, well, I have to die to myself and my addictions, and I have to die to myself and my lust and my greed. And though that can apply to us metaphorically, I believe that it should only be a secondary action to the first that he's talking about here. Because when Jesus is talking about death and suffering, he's not talking about, well, Peter, you got to let go of your addictions. He's saying, listen, you might die for the sake of the gospel. In fact, we read in scripture that nearly all of the disciples died as martyrs. All of the disciples died, or nearly almost all of the disciples died for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of spreading the kingdom and for the sake of spreading the good news. All of them, like nearly all of them did. However, a lot of the times in this Western culture, we take Jesus' words as metaphorical, but I believe that that is only a secondary thing. I believe that it's great. I, I think that it's so great that we can take Jesus' words as metaphorical in our life and be like, yeah, Jesus, I'm going to let go of my addictions. I'm going to let go of my lust, and I'm going to let go of my greed, and I'm going to let go of all of the things that don't please you. But are you ready to die? Are you ready to die? Listen, I don't believe this is going to be a popular message. I don't think that if we were to post this on social media, everybody would be like, yeah, let's do it. Ready to die. No. But I believe that somebody needs to speak about the literal death. You see, I mentioned in the beginning that a lot of the times we take Jesus' words as metaphorical and we take this little cross-bearing thing as almost metaphorical and we desensitize the cross. Do you understand that the cross was one of the most gruesome ways to die back then? 
There's a whole scientific study on why the nails in your hands and the feet and the nerves that go through your hand and the, the literal pain and, and when you're hanging on a cross, like every single breath, you need to push yourself up with those hands. Like you understand the gruesome death and we just carry around on our coffee mugs and Jesus, coffee. And we carry it around on our necklaces because, well, that's just what we need to do on, uh, we need to do when we post these Bible verses on Instagram, you know, uh, Philippians 4.13, do all things. Uh, do you understand that carrying a cross, like Jesus was literally carrying the mechanism of his death. Jesus was literally told, you're going to carry this cross for miles. And by the way, you're going to be crucified it. Do you understand that that's the same thing he's calling us to? Carrying every single day something. It's my cross to carry. And a lot of people will use it as an excuse. A lot of people will use, like, like oh, like, I'm, I'm in this addiction, man. It's, it's just my cross to carry. Okay, that's good. But you need to understand that at the end of that cross, there's a death. There needs to be a sacrifice. You see, a lot of the times we preach this gospel of, oh, well, the free gift of God. And though it is freely given, I believe that there's a cost. I believe that there's a cost for each and every one of us here to let go of the things that are holding us back. Let go of the things that are holding us back from the plan and the purpose of God. Jesus' words are not to be taken merely metaphorical. Let me ask you a question, and it's one that we need to deeply analyze. Is the American gospel, those, this westernized church, is it strong enough to withstand death? Because you go across seas, and death is not carrying their addictions. Death is death. Death is follow Christ in North Korea. You're dying. Some parts of China you're dying. Not only are you dying, your family is dying. I don't think they read this verse in, in, in the little churches, underground churches over in North Korea and in China, and they're like, oh, we got to let go of our addictions. No, they're literally ready to die. Are we? What if what's happening overseas was to somehow come into America? Where somehow the government now says, yes, if you're a Christian, you will die. Will this room be packed? Will this room be filled? Would you still come to church? Or would you just go into the societal norms and just be the, the, the little robot that you were called to be by whoever called you to be it? Or would you stand up and say, no, if it means death, it means death, but I'll never let go of my true convictions and the true knowledge of faith and the Savior. Is our faith merely based on the comfort of being able to believe what we can believe in America? Or is it just based on the conformity that we have here in this Western culture? Second thing is grow your tolerance. How many of you guys have ever been to a gym or maybe worked out or gone to play soccer or football or some, some sort of sport? Okay, cool. So maybe some, some musicians in the house. Um, you grow your tolerance. When I first played guitar, 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 my fingers killed me. They were bleeding because of how I was playing the guitar. And then you form what is called calluses, and your finger gets better, right? I know here, Adrian, Adrian's like, if you don't know him, he's like the Hulk. And, and so Adrian over here, he works out, right? And But sure enough, I don't think, unless you, you can let me know, 10 years ago, whenever you started working out, you're lifting what you've been lifting today, right? No, not at all. He's shaking his head because there's, it's, not, not, it's not smart, right? In fact, the other day I went to the gym, and the, uh, by the other day, I mean like three months ago, right? Um, and I went to the gym with my sister, and my sister was lifting more than me. And it wasn't, it wasn't that I couldn't live more than her, but I'm going f more, more for tone, not bulk, you know? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm riding out the fives, right? 
So sure enough, we go to the gym, and she's, like, ripping it, right? And I'm like, I can't let her beat me, right? So I grab, what was it, 25s? And I grab the 25s, and I'm just curling these bad boys, and I feel great doing it. And I was literally turns to me, and she's like, man, you might want to slow it down a little bit. I was like, no, like, this is none. This is lightweight, baby. And so sure enough, the, I was literally out for, like, a week. Because my bones were killing me. And I didn't understand, like, hey, do legs today, do whatever. I did everything. I went on the treadmill. I did cardio. I did legs. I did arms. I did every. She was like, hey, why don't you do back while I'm out? I was ripping my back, right? I was doing everything. I was like, this is nothing. I got home, and I, and I just felt sore for literally, what, what was it, like a week? I had heat pads. I was doing icy, hot. Every, I was doing everything. My house was like a hospital. Why? Because I didn't have the tolerance yet. I didn't have the tolerance to be able to do some of the things that other people have been doing for years. You see, a lot of the times we come in our life with Christians and we come into the first day and we're like, I'm going to do it all. I'm going to kill it. I'm going to do it all and everything's in. And the enemy's shooting and trying to attack. And at the first attack, we just go down. Why? Because you don't have the tolerance built up yet. You see, there's some things in my life personally that the enemy attacked me five years ago, and five years ago, it completely destroyed me, but now I'm like, okay, it don't matter. I already know the scheme. I already know the enemy. I already know what you're going to try to do, and you're not going to do it to me and my family anymore. And it literally stops there because he's like, I don't have a foothold. I don't have a place here. But a lot of the times, we need to understand that as our faith deepens and mature, we find ourselves better equipped to withstand the discomfort that comes from it. Because listen, you come here to church, this might be your first day at church, and you're like, I give my life to Christ. I give my heart to Jesus. I want to abide in Him. I want to do this. Or maybe you haven't been to church in a while, and you're like, okay, this is the day and I'm going to go and walk according to his plan and purpose, right? And you, and you get out of this room like Muhammad Ali, right? You're like, I'm ready to go, right? But what happens when you go back on Monday and somebody's like, hey, let's go get drunk. Hey, let's go party it up. Hey, what if, what if you get to work and all your coworkers are like, hey, let's go to that same bar we always go to. And you know what happens at that bar? What happens when you go back to your family and your family's like, hey, let's do something that you know you shouldn't be doing, but you've done it your whole life. But now you're changing. You want to know one of, the, one of the things that I think is one of the greatest weapons of the enemy? The greatest of the weapons of the enemy, or, or what I believe is one of the greatest weapons of the enemy, is the fact that there are people who are feeling all the right things but never acting upon it. They're feeling all the right things. They come to church, they pray, they do the church game, they do everything, and the enemy is basically saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let them go to church. I'll let him give a little bit of money to the church. I'll let him or her go to the Bible studies. I'll let him and her feel all the right things. As long as they don't change. I know y'all hear that. Because there are so many people that are hearing the right things. That have sat here and listened to all the right things. Have been coming to church for years. But change was never on the table. And when it comes to this tolerance aspect. It's going to be tremendously difficult I'm going to let you know right off the bat, tremendously difficult to, on Monday morning, step into the house, step into your workplace, step into your friend group, and start to tell the people around you, I've changed. I'm a follower of Christ, and I'm going to start acting like it. Not going to be easy. Let me tell you right now, you might lose friends. Let me tell you right now, it might be, you might be in a position where you might lose a job. You might be in a position where you're going to lose so many things but gain so much more. But let me tell you, some of the things that are happening today might happen tomorrow, 
and you know how to deal with it. And some of the things that you were dealing with a year ago, guess what? The enemy might try to affect you with it again, but you've gained your tolerance. And you're able to grow from it. And you're able to change. And you're able to be in a position of God. What affected me a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, the enemy can no longer affect me with it. Because I've learned to tolerate it. There's so many things in my life. I mentioned this to you. There's so many things in my life where I tell God, How funny is it that a year ago this would have completely tore me apart, but a year today, I'm just testifying about it. And I'm testifying that the enemy keeps trying his same old schemes, but I'm still conquering Christ. And guess what? I'm still dealing with stuff. I'm not perfect. My wife's not perfect. The leaders in this church aren't perfect. We deal with stuff. But guess what? A year from now, a month from now, We might be testifying and might be able to help others grow their tolerance by what God already did in us. And so when we look at our at scripture in Matthew 1130, it says this, my yoke is easy. My yoke is easy, not like egg yolk. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. You understand this? This reality that we will become more comfortable and like we're going to become, not, not necessarily comfortable, I don't want to get the, right, the wrong idea, but we will become more molded in our faith. Y'all ever buy new shoes? Like I bought Birkenstocks a while back and I love those shoes, but when I first tried them on, they hurt my feet awful. They were just so bad. I didn't know why everybody had them. I just hated them. And then like a month later, I was like, these are my favorite shoes because they have this special mold that molds to your feet. And if you ever go and try somebody else's Birkenstocks, you're going to be like, oh, those aren't mine immediately because they mold to your feet. It's really cool how they do that. But just as, just as many of us have shoes and we understand that concept, it's the same with faith. Just as those shoes eventually become more comfortable and easy to walk in, our faith becomes more manageable and fulfilling as we embrace it with our dedication and obedience. I've never been a fan of this gospel that just says, when you're in Christ, every single day is going to be awful and you're just going to be persecuted. And like, like, yeah, there are going to be days like that. But there's also going to be days where you're just like, wow, God is good. God is great. He's been amazing. I'm just molded. I'm becoming more tolerant. I'm growing my spiritual muscles. I'm just growing. I'm becoming more tolerant to the schemes of the enemies. I know that he's going to come at me this way. And so I'm going to block it off completely. Like that is such a great life as well. And it's also biblical. It's not like every single day. It's like, how are you doing? Oh, well, you know the battle. And you know you just know that everything is bad like no like walking in Christ is also great and it's also tremendously fulfilling knowing that you're fulfilling the purpose that God has called you to be in it's fulfilling to know that even in the pain I'm becoming stronger it's it's fulfilling to know that even in the heartaches and even in the tough times I can be in a position of God I know that this pain is only temporary for my purpose man That's so amazing to know. Ultimately, this will all lead to more profound sense of your purpose and fulfillment in your lives, in my lives, in all of our lives. And last, but certainly not least, is this pressure has purpose. Y'all get that? I'm going to say it again. Pressure has purpose. It has purpose. It has purpose in your life. So many people think if I have some sort of pressure, then I must be doing something wrong. No, you might be doing everything right. But God allows some things in your life so that you can grow. Your pressure in your life has purpose. In fact, some of the greatest things in life, diamonds are formed under pressure. Some of the greatest things in life, some of the greatest athletes, some of the greatest musicians, some of the greatest pastors in this world, you talk to them and ask them about their life, they had tremendous pressure, tremendous pain, tremendous suffering. There are many 
many ways the uncomfortableness of faith impacts our life. I asked you in the beginning if any of you have ever been uncomfortable. And the reality is, almost everybody here has faced discomfort. Whether it be in life, your relationship and your finances, your family, your faith walk. A lot of us have faced uncomfortable situations. We've experienced it all throughout our lives. We experience that uncomfortableness when our convictions are challenged. When we face rejections and when we recognize that our own sin is setting us aside and is separating us from God. We recognize it. We talked last week about convictions. Convictions, man, those are incredibly uncomfortable because you think you're doing something right or you might know you're not doing something right and God tells you, yeah, you're doing something wrong. Do it this way. And now you have to let go of a life, let go of a lifestyle, let go of an addiction, let go of something that God no longer wants in your life. It's tremendously uncomfortable. And I believe one of the greatest side effects of being a Christian, and hence why we're talking about it on the fourth week, is learning to be uncomfortable. We experience the pressure of living in a world that is not yet fully redeemed, and it's not comfortable. It's not comfortable to go outside and go to Publix and go to your family and let them know, hey, Christ loves you. It's not comfortable sometimes to go up to people and let them know, hey, listen, can I just tell you my testimony for a second of my life before Christ, my life with Christ, and what I'm expecting that is in store, knowing that the best is yet to come in my life because I follow Christ? Some people are going to shut you down. Some people are no longer going to want to be with you, want to want to want to touch you, want to anything. They're not going to want to be around you anymore. Some people are going to want to completely leave you simply for the sake of the gospel. However, pressure can be good. The sort of pressure, the sort of thing can sometimes be good. Sometimes in our life we will feel the discomfort of pleasure. We, uh, pressure. We will feel like, like there is pressure in being a Christian. We will feel like there is pressure in carrying a cross. We will feel that there's discomfort in walking in faith. You will feel the discomfort of telling others about your faith. You will feel the discomfort of telling people, I can no longer hang out with you anymore because you are leading me down a path that I no longer want want to leave there is discomfort but ask Jesus how much discomfort he faced ask Jesus when he was homeless with the disciples how that was uncomfortable ask Jesus how uncomfortable the cross was to carry for miles and miles ask Jesus how uncomfortable it was when the soldiers were lashing him on his back ask Jesus how uncomfortable it was when he began to preach and people were calling him a hypocrite ask Jesus how uncomfortable his life was but Jesus knew his purpose through all of it, he knew his purpose. He knew that all the discomfort, all the pain, all the suffering, and later on the death, all that pressure would lead to an ultimate victory on the cross. Do you understand the discomfort that Jesus faced? Man, Jesus was literally in the garden and as he was praying, he was sweating blood, a legitimate medical condition with so much pressure in his life. He was sweating blood, asking the Father, Father, can you just take this away from me? Because he was feeling the pressure. He was feeling the pressure of knowing that a few moments later he'd be denied and, and that later on he would die on a cross. There's pressure. I promise you today 
that there are some things in your life that can only be produced through pressure. Can y'all stand on up as we close on out today? And I want you to listen very closely because I believe that a lot of people in this room need to hear this today. Just for the next couple of minutes, focus in on God. There are some things in your life that can only ever be produced through pressure. I believe that there are some things that God didn't create necessarily. However, he's turning it around right now. He's turning it around for good. He's turning it around for his good. He's turning it around for his glory. There are some things that can only be produced through pressure. There are some characteristics that can only be produced through pressure. There are some things in your life that can only be produced in pressure. There are some habits in your life that can only be produced through pressure. Are you willing to face the pressure for the sake of your purpose? Are you willing to face the pressure in your life? And be like, yeah, I'm in a position where it's tough right now, where it's hard right now, where there's pain right now, where there's suffering right now. There's so much pressure, but God, oh God, I am so willing to take the pressure if it means that it'll lead to my ultimate purpose. Are you ready? God is turning over what the enemy meant for evil for his good. Today, right now, he's wanting that for you. He's wanting that for you. He's wanting to turn what the enemy meant for evil in your life for good. God is turning everything over for, for good. Satan meant that relational pressure for evil, but God is turning it for good. Satan meant that financial struggle for pressure, but God is turning it for good. Satan meant that boss that has just been killing you and grinding you for pressure, but God is turning it over for good. Satan meant that job loss for pressure, but God is turning it over somehow, some way for good. Satan meant that death of a family member over for pressure for good. He's turning things over for good. I don't know how he's going to do it. I have no clue how he's going to do it, but he's going to do it, I promise you. Satan is turning things over for evil, but God is switching them around and over for good. Man, I wonder how many people in the house of God this morning can testify of the goodness of God. Of the goodness and the pressure and knowing that God meant that diagnostic over, or Satan meant that diagnostic for, for evil, and God is turning it over. He meant all these things for evil, but God is turning it over for good. I believe that. I believe that there's breakthroughs happening today. I believe that there's miracles happening today. I believe that there's people who are losing and letting go of their chains today. I believe God is wanting to do something today. On the other side of your pressure is your purpose. On the other side of that pressure and that thing and that thorn in your side that has just been pressuring you all your life is your purpose. So can you handle it? Can you handle the pain? Can you handle the suffering? Can you handle being in a position of God? It hurts. God, what they did to me hurt me. God, that diagnostic I received from the doctor, it hurt. God, that relationship problem. Man, it's, it's hurting. God, that news that I got last week, man, it hurt. Are we willing to face the pressure, the pain, the struggle, the things in our lives, knowing that God is turning them over, knowing that it's going to lead to your ultimate purpose? Can you handle the pressure? Can you handle the persecution? Can you handle dying? Can you handle these things? Discomfort is inevitable. However, here's what we need to leave this place knowing. 
This is the only thing I want you to, 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 to ingrain in your brain for this week and beyond. When the pressure comes, when the struggle comes, when the pain, when whatever comes, three words. Remember your purpose. It's simple. It's simple. Remember your purpose. Remember why you were placed in this planet. Remember why God intricately formed you in your mother's womb. Remember that God. Man, I believe that whenever the enemy comes to you and tries to tell you something, if you were to just remember your purpose, if you were to were just to remember the calling in your life. Listen, I look out into a room and I don't just see people. I see people who are able to spread the gospel. I see ministers. I see pastors. I see people who are going to go in the medical field and completely just, just make room for God in medical rooms. I believe there's people in this room who are going to go into doing politics. And I believe that they're going to just transform it so that, so that God will be glorified through it. I believe that there's people in this room who are just going to take every single opportunity. Don't let the enemy tell you you're not good enough. Don't let the enemy tell you you're not strong enough. Don't let the enemy tell you you'll never amount to anything. Listen, listen to what God says and continuously remember your purpose. Remember what God spoke of you. Remember that you're redeemed. Remember that you're called. Remember that you're a daughter and a son of the King. Remember that you're delivered and set free. Remember the things that God calls you to be. You want to know your purpose? Here it is. Matthew 28, 19 through 20 says this, Therefore go. That go for us is a little uncomfortable. That word go means you have to step out of where you're at. That word go means I'm here and I got to go somewhere. You see, we become so comfortable in just doing this routine Christian thing here. And God's saying, you got to move to the left. You got to move to the right. You got to move forward. You got to go backward. You got to find people. Are you willing to share the gospel? It says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then it continues in saying in verse 20, and teaching them, teach them. How are they supposed to know what they have to do if you don't teach them? You can't expect the child to know how to do multiplication or addition or subtraction if you don't teach them. And God, he's saying, go teach them because they don't know what to do. Just go teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, what a promise here, right? Surely, I am with you always. Not only yesterday, not only today, but tomorrow and next week and next year and the time after that. It says to the very end of the age, he's with you. He's sustaining you. He's keeping you. Your job is this. Go. Make disciples of all nations. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We literally have little things in our lobby right now. You can literally go and on your way out, grab one of them, grab two of them, grab three of them. Don't grab, a, don't grab a ton and just throw them out. Grab a couple. And in your head, begin to pray for these little flyers. It says, I'm saving you a seat. You know why? Because God is calling you to go, grab somebody and be like, yeah, you might not like this for the first day, but here, this is what transformed my life. It might be a little uncomfortable, but, but here, come listen about the Savior of the world. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who loves you. Go and make disciples. You need to step out of your comfort zone. You need to, step, you need to learn to be uncomfortable a little bit. Don't let discomfort get in the way of your purpose. Don't let discomfort get in the way of your purpose. Each and every one of you are called. And I believe that the enemy is turning some things over right now for good. Things that you thought you were defeated in, but he's saying, no, no, no. You are going to be victorious in this. You are going to live a life where it might be a little uncomfortable, but at least you'll know you'll be fighting with God. Father, Lord, I know how uncomfortable it can be 
I know how uncomfortable it can be to step into this room for the first time. I know how uncomfortable it can be to step into a room where everybody's lifting up their hands and you're like, what are we lifting up our hands for? I know that it's uncomfortable to step into a room and sing to somebody that you might not even be able to see. I know that it's uncomfortable to speak out in your faith to others that might completely reject you and persecute you because of it. I know that it's uncomfortable to talk about Jesus sometimes, Father, but let us be a generation and a congregation of believers that believe in the gospel, that believe in the Great Commission, and believe that, yeah, it might be a little bit uncomfortable, but if it leads to more people coming to you, God, if it leads to more lives transformed, if it leads to more people going to heaven, if it leads to heaven becoming more populated, God, I don't care what the people are going to think. I don't care how uncomfortable it's going to get. I'm going to do it for the sake of the gospel. I'm going to do it for the sake of your kingdom. I'm going to do it because I know that it's the commission that you commanded me to be. And maybe the pressure hurts. Maybe the pain hurts. Maybe it seems like there's nowhere to go, God. But let us always remember, what is my purpose? What is my plan, God? I know you're turning things over right now. I know you're turning addictions over right now. I know you're turning things and generational curses on some families right now. I know that you can do it. I know that we're going to see a victory. I know it because I believe in your word and your promise. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's sing this out. Thank you, God. Yes, Lord. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to try us. So my God will never fail. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. Begin to declare this right now. it's really high or really low I just want you to lift up your hands and I want you to receive this blessing on you right now just right here in this room just begin to declare that everything that the enemy meant for evil in your life every stronghold every addiction every pressure every pain every relational issue every financial issue right now God is turning it over and begin to believe it, begin to receive it. Lift up your hands and just say, God, I want to receive it right now. I want you to just invade in my life and begin to see a victory in my life. Come on, let's sing this out as a congregation together. Come on. You take the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. turn it around. You turn it for good. turn it around right now. Away. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil,
all the voices we sing. Come on, just the voices, sing that loud. Come on, sing, I'm gonna see it now. Over our family, over our kids, over this nation, God. Come on, keep up, keep it up, I'm gonna see it. Don't just let it be words, let it be a prayer. Believe in it, God. Just one more time, let's sing that as one voice. We sing. I'm gonna see victory. I'm gonna see your victory. For the battle belongs to you. I'm gonna see it. I'm gonna see your victory. I'm gonna see your victory. It's our prayer, God. your presence is so felt right now. God, you are moving and you're sweeping through this place. You're moving and removing everything that the enemy placed in our lives and in our hearts for evil, and you're switching it around for your glory, God. And for some of us, we don't even know what this whole God thing is, but today you felt something in your heart. And today you felt the love and the embrace and literally just the Father God just, just saying, I love you. I want you. You have a purpose. You have a plan. And if that was you, I want with every head bowed, every eyes closed, I want to pray this prayer. And I want you to pray this from the depth of your heart. And I want you to accept Jesus in your life. I want you to accept the designer and the creator into your heart today. The person who intricately created and made you for a plan is in this room and he wants you to come back to him. I want you to say these words, Father, I love you. Father, I understand that my sin has separated me from you. But today, God, I choose to stand in my purpose. I choose to reclaim the purpose that you have given me, Father. Father, I accept you in my heart. Father, I repent from all of my old ways. Father, I repent from all of my old sins. And today, I walk in accordance to your plan. I walk back into a relationship with you. With every eye closed, every head still bowed. Nobody's looking. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to lift up your hand so I can see you. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. You can put your hand down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for all of the people that today are called children of the living God because they came back to you, Father. The Bible literally says there is a celebration in heaven right now, and we choose to celebrate today as well, knowing that we have victory over the grave, knowing that Jesus conquered the grave, knowing that he is the one who was and is and is to come knowing that there are children who are coming back into a place of being with their loving heavenly father jesus i pray that as we leave this place that we would never forget our purpose that we would always remember that even in the uncomfortable moments god we need to learn to become a little bit more comfortable for the sake of spreading the gospel for the sake of growing in that relationship with you, for the sake of being able to share your word to every single nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In your name we pray. Amen.
and amen. Encounter Church, we love you. If you prayed that prayer, we want to talk to you in the lobby. We want to give you next steps. If you need prayer today, come right up here. We have one of our leaders coming up here. He will pray for you. She will pray for you. We love you guys, and we hope you have a phenomenal week. God bless.